to our God a new song. God has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in joyous song, song and sing praises. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the world and its people sing together for joy. With great joy, let us join our voices in this morning's call to worship printed in your bulletin. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread. But the glory lies in the law of the Lord, and on the law of the day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season. Their leaves are not there, and all that they do will be lost. I invite you all now to stand as you are able and join together in singing our opening hymn of the morning, hymn number 455, All Creatures of Our God and King.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. We thank you, Almighty God, for the life of Jesus among us and that he reigns in power for us. Strengthen our hope and bless the work of our hands that we may live as his body in this world. And now, using the words he taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I invite you now to greet those sitting around you at the peace of Christ. Welcome to Buford Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you are all here with us this morning. And on this morning, we do extend a special welcome to those visiting with us. We do hope that Buford is a warm and welcoming congregation for you, a place that you know and feel God's spirit as you worship. On this day, too, we do also extend a very happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers here this morning. It is a special day to honor and to acknowledge our mothers and all that they do for us. But it is, too, for some in our midst, a very difficult day. And so, as the church, we hold those two things in tension. And as scripture tells us, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we mourn with those who mourn this day. You will find in your bulletins the announcements that are happening in the life of our congregation and a schedule of that upcoming activities. I do invite you to take a look at those. Um, be sure to read through them at some point. At this time, I'm going to call to your attention a few of those. Last Sunday, we collected an offering for relief in Nepal. You'll still find um, in some of your pews these airmail envelopes. We do invite you to still give to that offering if you are so led. But last Sunday alone, we raised $456 for the relief efforts in Nepal. And so we give thanks for that. All of that will go to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, who is already on the ground there, um, and will help with the relief efforts taking place. We had a great work day here yesterday for Vacation Bible School, and we are thankful for all those who showed up to help get ready for Vacation Bible School. Today is the last day to register, so if you still have a child or a grandchild that you would like to attend Vacation Bible School, we do ask that you please get them registered today. It is the last day. And our final work day for VBS, as we're gearing up, um, will be on Saturday, May the 30th, here at the church at 9 a.m. We'll begin at 9 and stay until we are finished. And we do really need all hands on deck. So if you are available that day and able to help, we invite you to come out and to join us. Child care will be available. Tomorrow night, the Monday night Bible study will have its final gathering for the year um, before we break for the summer months. Uh, we will celebrate tomorrow evening with a meal at the home of Joan Smith at 6.30. All are invited. If you do not know where Joan lives, you can come see me after worship um, or give me a call or email. I'll be glad to give you directions. But um, dinner tomorrow night at 6.30 at the home of Joan Smith. Next Sunday, we will honor and celebrate our graduates, all of our graduates, high school, college, and graduate programs. 
Um, if you are graduating or if you love someone who is um, and you have not contacted me with um, their information, if you would do so, so we will have the correct information for the bulletin um, next week. We will also honor those folks with the reception following worship um, in the gathering area around um, the other side of the church. So we invite you to be a part of that. Many of you may have even forgotten about these, but we have promised you, those of you that sat for pictures earlier in the fall, we have promised directories, and those directories are coming. They will ship on May the 20th, so we are super excited about that, um, and we hope to get those out to you as soon as we can after we receive those. But do know that they are coming, and please stay tuned for more information about how to get your hands on those. The youth have two upcoming fundraisers, a car wash this Saturday, um, May the 16th from 10 until 2 here at the church. If your car is covered in as much pollen as mine is, you can come on out and we will wash that for you here in the front church parking lot this coming Saturday. Um, and in a few weeks on May the 30th, we will host a pancake breakfast at Applebee's in Sugar Hill. You can get your tickets in the narthex for seven dollars come get a full stomach and then come back to the church um, and help us set up for vbs it'll be a great morning i know there is no youth group tonight or youth choirs children choir children's choirs anything like that this evening um, so no no activities here at the church are there other announcements that folks have let us continue to worship god We have been called to follow Christ by obeying his one commandment, that we love one another as he has loved us. Having fallen short of that love, let us now confess our sins before God and one another. God of mercy, we admit that so many times we are quick to judge others and to register our opinions as to who is fit for the heavenly kingdom. We think our wisdom is sufficient for us to know who you call and elect for salvation. Teach us humility, saving God, that leads us to live with compassion and to see the world more as you see it. Open us to the winds of your Holy Spirit that often blow in ways we least expect. Hear now of the silent confessions of sin we make to you. Amen. In baptism, God has claimed us and joined us to Christ as one body. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. Hear the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God and amen. Please be seated.
At this time, we'd like to invite the rest of our children forward for our children's sermon this morning with Tracy Brack. Good morning. How are you today? Good. So raise your hand if you're excited that school is about to be out. Whoa. Me too. All right. Okay. I have a question. So raise your hand for me if you know the answer or if you have an answer because it has more than one answer. At school, where do you go to find the answers to your questions? Where do you go? Books. Books. Very good answer. I like it. You agree with him? I agree with him too. Yes. Computers. Computers Google.com. Your mind. Very good. You can work with God. Yes, you can. One more. Mom. Mom, Mom always knows the answer. That's a good, a good answer. Okay, well, the Bible, somebody had the very first one. Bo, good job. The Bible is a book that we can always go to to find the answers. Okay, now let me ask you this. At school, have you ever seen someone who is maybe a little different and doesn't always fit in with everybody? This morning at the early service, there was a little girl and she said that there's a boy in her class that bites people all the time, so she's kind of scared of him. But um, sometimes there are people who don't always fit in. Maybe they bite you, maybe they hurt your feelings, or maybe they're just a little bit different. And in the verse that, or the... Um, the Bible story today that we're going to hear Pastor Corey tell us about um, in the book of Acts, there's a man named Philip, and he encounters um, people who don't quite fit in. There are some people that um, he's not supposed to talk to because they're considered outsiders, people from Samaria, there are some people from Ethiopia, and the world says that he's not supposed to talk with them. But God says, he tells him to go and talk, and talk to them. And so Philip listened to God. And the people were changed. People who didn't know Jesus learned about Jesus' love. But just as important, Philip was changed by God's love because he saw that his love is bigger than any of the boundaries that we as people try to put on loving other people. So remember, no matter how smart you get, no matter how big you get, you can always look to the Bible for wisdom and to love others the way that God teaches us to love. Okay? So let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us without boundaries. And thank you for teaching us each day to love more and more. Thank you for mothers. Thank you for grandmothers. Thank you for parents who bring us here to learn about you. And thank you for loving us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, you created the world and all that is in it. You created us, humankind, both male and female, in your image. You created us first and foremost to be in relationship and to love. 
to love you and to love our neighbors. And we are only able to do that because you loved us first. Scripture reminds us that you love us like both the father who welcomes the prodigal home and the mother who nurtures her children. This day, O oh God, as we gather to worship you, we pray especially for our mothers. We give you thanks for mothers who love and care for their children and are loved and cared for right back. But we also pray for women who have longed for children and don't or can't have them. We pray for women who weren't able to keep their promises to their children, for children who grew up without the love and care they deserved and needed. We pray this day for grandmothers, for those for whom that turned out to be exactly what they dreamed it would be, and for those for whom it didn't turn out as they expected or hoped. We pray for mothers with sick children and children with sick mothers. We pray for mothers with children who are lost or missing, and mothers of children who died too soon. Children with mothers who are missing and mothers who died too soon. We pray for those who grieve what they had and those who grieve what they never had. We pray for women who are afraid. We pray for all of the dilemmas and the doubts and the fears, frustrations and heartaches and richness and wonder and sleeplessness of parenting. We pray for mothers who parent by themselves, for women who carefully negotiate life with stepchildren, for women trying to adopt, and for women hoping fertility treatments will renew disappointed hope. We pray for mothers whose children have grown up and moved out, and for those whose children have grown up and not moved out. We pray for women who mother the children of others. We pray for women who give birth in every conceivable way to ideas and art and possibility and wonder and joy, to new life in job contexts and in relational ones. On this complicated day, O oh God, we are reminded again of just how much will not fit on a greeting card but we are too reminded of what does fit into your full awareness of all that is, that does fit into your investment in love in, and grace in and through all circumstances. We pray for mothers in all the fullness of what all it can mean, informed by what we know of all those that we know gratefully trusting you to know so much more than we can do or be, gratefully trusting you with the hearts of those we love, gratefully trusting you with all of the deep pain and great joy we know and feel this day. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 68, verses 25 to 35. Listen now for God's word speaking to us this day. Summon your might, O God. Show your strength, O God, as you have done for us before. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings bear gifts to you. Rebuke the wild animals that live among the reeds, the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples. Trample underfoot those who lust after tribute. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Let the bronze be brought from Egypt let Ethiopia hasten to stretch out its hands to God. 
Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. O rider in the heavens, the ancient heavens, listen. He sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is over the skies. Awesome is God in his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let us join together in singing hymn number 495, We Know That Christ Is Raised. be seated. Our second scripture reading this morning is the story told of the encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch told in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts verses 26 through 40. Listen again for the word of God. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, 
About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, he came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ozotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Over the years, this story of the encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch has become one of my very favorite stories in the Bible, and I'm not really sure why. It is kind of a strange and quirky story in, in many ways involving an early evangelist, one who would be a supporting actor in the drama of Acts. He doesn't play the prominent role of, of Peter or of Paul, but he does play a, a significant role, and most significant of all perhaps in this story. But this story about this early evangelist and also this, this story about a man who has been physically mutilated, presumably to make him fit to serve in the court of the Egyptian, of the Ethiopian queen. It has an odd sense of place about it, too, if you think about it, with Philip finding himself suddenly in the presence of this eunuch from Ethiopia, and then just as suddenly snatched away from him. It can be said, I think, with, with real certainty that this story has a very significant place within the larger story of the development of the Christian church. At this point in, in the book of Acts, in the 8th chapter, the gospel is just beginning to be spread out over to other places well beyond Jerusalem and to people other than just the pious Jewish people who lived in that region. It's beginning to go out into all the world just as Jesus said that it would. And the baptism of an Ethiopian eunuch is a sure sign that the Holy Spirit unleashed in the world is creating a harvest of believers that many of God's people never ever expected to see. It was of course in that world quite unthinkable that anyone could conceive of God's blessing, God's claiming of the life of a eunuch. It says right there in the book of Deuteronomy, in the 23rd chapter right there, that eunuchs are not allowed in the assembly of the Lord. In other words, they weren't allowed to worship or to make sacrifice at the temple. They were considered impure and unholy. They weren't allowed in. Some have tried to say that the Ethiopian eunuch represents the very first Gentile that was converted. Uh, other than, of course, uh, Cornelius. We know of Cornelius. And Cornelius was a Roman officer. In the 10th chapter, he received conversion. But to mistake the Ethiopian eunuch as a Gentile, I think, would be a mistake because, after all, he had come from Jer Jerusalem where it says he had worshipped. And this has led many people to speculate that he was what was called a God-fearer. A God-fearer in that time was a class of person who believed in Yahweh, who followed the law of Moses, but was not considered fully Jewish because he had not been circumcised. And this was obviously a prob problematic situation when it came to eunuchs. He was reading a scroll that contained the words of the prophet Isaiah. And it seems impossible in a way that a Gentile would have had the means or even the interest to read such a scroll containing the words of a Hebrew prophet. But it's also significant to note that he was Egyptian, I mean Ethiopian. In ancient times, Ethiopia was often considered to be anything that was south of Egypt, anything down in the vast 
continent of Africa was called Ethiopia. Ethiopia was a word that meant to many people of the ancient Middle East the end of the world, the jumping off place from which you can go no farther. In this we can see that even though the encounter actually takes place on the Gaza Road near Jerusalem, the baptism of an Ethiopian represents a word of grace and truth that goes as far as it must go in order to gather up the flock of God, a God who serves as a shepherd to lost sheep. God's grace knows no geographical boundary. It goes to the end of the earth, and we know from history that it has continued to go outward from the very earliest years of its existence in the Holy Land to spread across almost every nation on the face of the earth. It's easy to think about this passage as having two characters, but it really has three. It's obvious, I think, that the, the, the eunuch and, and Philip are characters in the story, but I think that we would also be wise to consider the Holy Spirit as an actor in this drama. After all, it's the Spirit who points Philip in the right direction, going toward Gaza. It's the Spirit who instructs him to go over and speak to the eunuch to begin with. And it's the Spirit who snatches Philip away once baptism has been received. If we read closely here, we realize that the witness of Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch and the baptism that he administered to him were not really actions of Philip at all, but of God directing Philip's steps, inspiring him, lifting him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in charge of everything that happens in this story. If he had ever been called on the carpet by pious Jewish leaders of his day to account for his actions, baptizing an Ethiopian eunuch, if he'd been called on the carpet like Peter would for baptizing Cornelius, Philip would likely have said something similar to what Peter had to say. He probably would have said that the Holy Spirit made him do it. He knew he wasn't supposed to do it, but it had seemed better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission when, when the Spirit of God had led him in so obvious a way. Maybe if forced to make a choice, he would say that he was far more fearful of disobeying God than he was of disobeying the Jewish leaders in the story. It's not always easy to accept that God may be doing some sort of new thing in the world. I think most of us really want God, think of God perhaps as being rather predictable. We want to know what the rules are. We want to know what the boundary lines are over which we dare not step. The ancient Jews who so diligently learned and studied the Word of God, who so regularly prayed prayers to a God they believed loved them and, and really only them, these pious people who carried the tradition of their ancestors and, and followed them in all the ways in the ancient paths that they had walked, these were the very people who missed the one in whom the Word of God was made flesh. They missed the new thing that God was doing and were slow to accept that someone like an Ethiopian eunuch could ever be included in the plan for God's salvation. How could God possibly love an Ethiopian or a eunuch the way that God loves a child of Abraham, especially one who is righteous and blameless according to the law? For the eunuch's part, it seems almost ironic, I think, that he would be reading Isaiah. That prophet of God who, who spoke of God's servant, often thought of to be a reference to the Messiah, as one who was like a lamb being led to a slaughter, as one who remained silent before those who sheared him, and who also spoke of a day, Isaiah did, when eunuchs would be welcomed into the assembly and given a name better than the names of sons and daughters. But as he is reading a scroll from Isaiah, he cannot understand its meaning, and so Philip comes along to offer assistance as guided by the Holy Spirit. I wonder what he told the eunuch about what he was reading. We don't have any detail. But did Philip 
tell him how all of these scriptures had come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ? Suffering servant of God who, who turned over the tables in the temple saying, My house shall be a house of prayer for all the people? Did He tell him that Jesus was the new temple to whom we are all invited? Even foreigners, even eunuchs. Did He tell him that Jesus had no children, but that God was giving him a family too numerous to count? Did He tell him that he, the eunuch, could become a part of this everlasting family? Did He tell him that? We don't know exactly what the content of Philip's witness was, but whatever Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, it is clear that it cut him right to his heart. It broke down barriers that the eunuch must have thought would be in place forever. And so he asked the question, the question that reverberates in the ears of the church to this very day, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Reminded of a story told by Pastor Michael Linval of events that took place in a small Presbyterian church, a small kind of rural church in a small town in, in Minnesota. Seems that a request had come from a woman in the church for her grandson to be baptized, but the situation was kind of sticky because her daughter, the baby's mother, was 18 years old and unwed. And the baby's father was away serving in the military, but had expressed no intention, no desire of, of helping out, of supporting either the child or the mother once the baby was born. Tina, the young mother, had made some decision, decisions uh, she regretted, but it, it still seemed important to her and to her mother, the child's grandmother, that they baptize this child. The congregation, it seems, also had a custom of asking who stands with this child, at which point the, all the extended family there would, would stand and would remain standing for the entirety of the time that they were observing the baptism. In this family-oriented church where so many people were deeply connected and related to one another and, and where there was so much family support underlying most of the people there, it hurt the members of the session to think of that question being asked and of having only the child's grandmother to stand on his behalf. That was what they envisioned would happen. When it was put to a vote, the session unanimously approved the baptism, but only after wondering what might ultimately come of this situation. The baptism was scheduled to take place on the Sunday before Christmas, and I'm going to pick up uh, with Michael Lindball's own account in, in his words. And he writes as follows. He says, The church was full as it always is the Sunday before Christmas. The rumored snow had not yet come, though the sky was heavy with it. After the sermon, the elder who was to assist me in the baptism stood up beside me at the font and read the words that I had written out for him on a 3 by 5 card. Tina Corey presents her son for baptism. Down the aisle she came. Nervously, briskly, smiling at me only, shaking slightly with month-old Jimmy in her arms, a blue pacifier stuck in his mouth. The scene hurt, all right, every bit as much as we knew that it would. So young this mother was, so alone. One could not help but remember another baby boy born long ago to a young and unwed mother in difficult circumstances. I read the opening part of the service noting Mildred Corey, the child's grandmother, sitting strangely out of place on the front pew. And then I asked, who stands with this child? I nodded at Mildred slightly to coax her to her feet. She rose slowly, looking to either side, and then returned my smile. My eyes then went back to my service book and my notes. I was just about to ask Tina the parents' questions of commitment when I became aware of movement in the pews. Angus McDowell had stood up in his blue serge suit, his wife Minnie beside him. Then a couple of other elders stood up. Then the sixth grade Sunday school teacher stood up. Then a new young couple in the church and soon 
before my incredulous eyes, the whole church was standing up with little Jimmy. Tina was crying, and Mildred was holding on to the pew in front of her as though she was standing on the deck of a ship rolling in a great wind, which in a way, she was. So the Ethiopian eunuch asked the question of Philip, what is to prevent me from being baptized? And then Philip led him down into the water and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One of the questions that, that I have asked and I've heard many other people ask through the years concerns who we will see in heaven. So many people myself included, are kind of curious about that, and we ask the question. It's my assumption that, that most of us, if not every single one of us, would say that we are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ, and that we have received that faith as a gift from God freely given to us. On that, we would stand in agreement, at least, I hope, in general agreement. But where it gets tricky is the point we begin to interpret what it really means to have faith, what it really means to be obedient to God. My guess is that our notions about what it means to profess faith in Jesus Christ would vary quite a bit if we began to have a, a deep and open discussion about that. And as a result... We each likely might have, I think, would have our own ideas about who it is that we may see in heaven one day. In the Reformed tradition, we acknowledge that God, and we use the word, elects the saved to experience salvation. In other words, it is God's job to make judgments and render verdicts. It's not our job. But as we wonder who will be in heaven, in a way, maybe what we're really wondering is this. Who will be those among whom God elects? Who will God elect for salvation? Who will God choose? And what will the criteria be by which God makes those kinds of choices? We know, well, we know that, that Jesus did once teach that the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and that there are few who find it. And elsewhere that the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few. We also see again and again throughout the book of, of, of Acts, from the chapter I just read through the chapters that follow, that, that God in the book of Acts threw the door wide open when Jesus Christ was raised and victory over the grave had been won. As hymn writer Fanny Crosby puts it so famously, Christ opened the life gate that all may go in. We've all sung that hymn. I'm here this morning to tell you and to remind myself that we may be surprised at who we see in heaven. We may think that we know, and we may be partially right, we may be mostly right, but I doubt that any of us are completely sure about that because the grace of God is inscrutable. That is to say, we cannot know it. We cannot know it in full. God's election of us or of those we love for salvation is not something over which we ultimately have any real control other than our doing our very, very best to remain faithful and obedient to God as best we know how as we are directed by the Holy Spirit. It's never up to us to determine who is or who isn't included in the kingdom of God and thank God for that. We may be surprised who we see in heaven. You see, God may be far more merciful than we are. It's my conviction and likely yours that the eight young men and women professing their faith in Christ and being confirmed today have been called by God in some way. That Their sense of, of being called may not be very clear right now. They're, they're uh, eighth and ninth graders, they're, they're very young, but they have begun to explore their faith with more depth. There's going to be more spiritual growth as the years go by. And my hope is that they will never ever stop growing spiritually as long as they live, and that's my hope for all of us. We need to continue to grow each day and each week that we live. 
But this class, these young people have been called, and today they will confirm the promises that were made much earlier when each of these young people received the sacrament of baptism. And if that grace from God is real, there is nothing any one of us can do to prevent it from taking root in all of their lives. We cannot hinder the Spirit of God once it has been unleashed and begins to run free in our lives. So the eunuch wants to know what there is that might hinder him from being baptized, what might prevent him from being baptized. And while Philip knows, he knows what it says in Deuteronomy about eunuchs joining the assembly, and he knows that Ethiopia is the end of the earth as far as he's concerned, far, far away from Jerusalem. And he knows that the, the powers that be that sit in the seats of authority might kick him clear out of the temple for doing so. He goes down into the water with the eunuch. And the shadow of the Holy Spirit falls upon them. No one knows for sure whatever became of the Ethiopian eunuch. It says in the passage that he went away rejoicing, but we don't know any more than that. He's never mentioned again in the writings of Scripture. But the Roman historian Eusebius, a man who converted to Christianity early in the 4th century, wrote that the eunuch went back to his homeland, to Ethiopia, and he became an evangelist there. But those records are sketchy, and the truth, I think, is difficult really to know. However, we can easily imagine that the experience of having been received by God and submerged in the waters of baptism, despite all the things that might have prevented that happening, surely changed his life and brought him hope. As one who had been made to feel outside the plan of God, he was now brought inside. As one who had himself been shorn like a sheep and who had suffered humiliation, he was now brought into relationship with the one who also suffered and was humiliated for the sake of humanity. As one who came from the end of the earth, he was now blessed by a blessing that reaches out to people of every nation on the face of the earth. When I said at the outset of the message that I didn't know, why this had become one of my favorite Bible passages, I may have misspoken. I think I do know why I like it so much. I think I like it because it teaches me that there is no place I can go where God cannot find me. There is no need for me to worry, to worry about where I was born or what my parents' names were or who they were or what kind of car I drive or anything else. The gift we get from acknowledging the grace of God at work in our lives is the freedom we receive from knowing that only God matters. Only God chooses and elects. God is in control. And when all is said and done, I think God mostly cares about what is inside of my heart and what is inside of your hearts. Nothing else is of lasting value. Everything else is of secondary importance. And this seems a good and important thing for me to know. But I still wonder who I might meet in heaven. And I hope one day, perhaps, that I might meet a certain Ethiopian eunuch who dared to wonder aloud if God could bless even him. Asking Philip what was to prevent him from being baptized, the Holy Spirit leaned into the ear of Philip, saying, Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Amen. Let us now stand. Let us not stand yet. Let us receive our confirmation class first. Sometimes you get on automatic pilot. You're... It uh, has been the distinct pleasure of our confirmation class teachers, Matt Marietta and Eleanor Thompson, to, since the beginning of the school year, to have led our confirmation class, a class made up of students in our church, 
most of them eighth graders, one ninth grader, who have dedicated themselves to a year of study and preparation, uh, a time of learning, and not just learning content about their faith, but talking about what it means for them to believe, what it means for them to profess Christ as Lord and Savior. And so at this time, I'm going to ask Matt Marietta and Eleanor Thompson, if they would, to come forward and stand with the class, and we're thankful for your teaching ministry this past year. And I'm going to introduce the members of the class one by one and ask them to stand right, right here. First of all, Samantha Baker, daughter of Chris and Jenny. Grace Bowman, daughter of Lynn and Tracy. Michael Christian, son of John and Stephanie. Miller Horn, son of Jim and Beth. Samantha Kim, daughter of Sonny and Annie. Brian Limekuller, son of Tim and Lori. Donovan Richard, son of Dan and Dina. And Ashley Smith, daughter of David and Michelle. Please join me in a word of prayer. O loving God who gives us life and redemption in Jesus Christ, it is you we praise on this day. We are most thankful for these eight young men and women you have placed before us. They remind us of your covenant promises and demonstrate the ways that your grace touches lives and makes tremendous impact upon us. Lord God, lay your hand upon each of these young people who today have made their profession of faith. They have been nurtured for this day, indeed for this moment. Guide them each one by your spirit. Involve them in the life and ministry of this congregation and increase their understanding as you strengthen their faith. Be with those who love them, with their parents and grandparents, with all of those who have supported and led them to this very moment. This we pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You all have had a time of study. You have thought about many different things related to the words of Scripture, related to your own faith and your own understanding of God. They have written wonderful statements of faith they shared with our session at our earlier meeting this morning. And they did a, I can't tell you what a, a wonderful job they did and how much thought they, they put in to those documents. And we appreciated hearing from you on that. And so it is that I ask you the following questions professing your faith in Christ. Do you admit that you are a sinner needing God's help to overcome the sin in your life? Do you? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son? Do you accept Him as your Savior? And do you trust Him to bring you God's forgiveness and help? Do you? Do you promise to let God's Spirit lead you so that you can live as a follower of Jesus, obeying His Word and showing His love? Do you? Do you pledge to serve Jesus in His church by supporting and taking part in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? Do you accept the way the church is organized and promise to work for its harmony and its good? Do you? This is a special day. It is a special day for each one of you, for your parents, and for this entire congregation. Just as Pastor Corey said in his sermon today, this is a day of promises that have been fulfilled. Every time we baptize a child or an infant right over there, this is the day with great hope and expectation that we wait for, that one day they will stand up and profess their faith for themselves, just as you are doing and have done today. And so we are very proud of you and very excited for you because this is a beginning and not an ending. It may seem a little like an ending, a confirmation class coming to an end, but really it's just the beginning of a journey for each of you as disciples 
of Jesus Christ. And so I would like to share with you a passage of scripture that is special to me. And it's my hope that you will hear in this passage words that you will carry with you during this journey. This passage comes from Isaiah chapter 43. Now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. You are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. Those are God's words for you. This journey may not always be easy. Notice in the passage, it doesn't say if you go through the fire, but when. It won't be easy. It will be hard, but there will also be great joy. And so my hope for you is that you will always know and hear God who loves you. That you will always know that God who loves you is with you, no matter what. You are all disciples of Jesus Christ. He has commissioned you. Live in his love and serve him. You are not too young to do that, no matter what anybody may tell you. Live in his love and serve him. Be filled with gratitude. Let the message of Christ dwell among you in all its richness. And whatever you do, whether you speak or act, whether you text or Insta or Snapchat, whatever you do, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, our creator, through him. Amen. Now we invite you all to stand with our newest members of this congregation and let us all profess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> I would invite all of you uh, following our service today to seek out these young people and to make sure that they feel welcomed in the life of the church. We're very proud of each and every one of them and all the hard work that they put into it. You may be seated. God's gifts to us are many. There are many that we are aware of, many that we see, and that there are I trust are many also that we are not even aware of, ones unknown to us. God has richly blessed us with things material and things spiritual. With thankful hearts for how God has worked in our lives, let us now respond by giving to God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Lord God, we bring these gifts today. We bring them so that the work of the church might be done. Lord, help us to be generous of spirit. Help us to be kind in our dealings with others. Help us to be of an inclusive spirit with people who are not like us. Lord, receive these gifts we bring that it might build up your church, both near and far, that it might be a way in which we are confirmed in our own way by the things that we give to you. This we pray in the righteous name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together now singing our final hymn of the morning, hymn number 388, O Jesus, I Have Promised. And now the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's only Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be with us and those we love and those who love God's kingdom everywhere, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>